All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Well, welcome to Afidi Pasadena. It's uh, been a pleasure speaking here in the past, and every time I come here, I've talked about a different topic. I'm pretty darn diversified when it comes to real estate, and uh, you'll learn that tonight. But tonight, we're going to be focusing on how to build a five-year real estate retirement plan. Anybody interested in that? Yes. Okay, well, it's... It's, it's in a simple form tonight. We can make it as complex as you like, but I'm all about simplicity. And so that way you can take a lot of notes. You're more than welcome to. And um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I got a cool laser on here. I'm good. All right. So there's a couple of questions that you should be asking yourself this evening. And these questions are this. How can we create more wealth swiftly and sustainably? And how do we maximize our gains safely? Look, a lot of people don't want to get investing because they're afraid of the big F word, fear, right? Fear is slapped right across the face, and they like the luxuries, they like the glamour, they like the idea of investing, but they're afraid to do so and part with their money. Number one, it's a cost factor. Most Americans think, what is it going to cost me? And that's the wrong way of thinking. Your thinking should be, What's my ROI factor? What's my return on investment factor? That's a huge different way to look at stuff. So for an example, if I'm going to look at a piece of property, I'm not going to say, oh, what's going to cost me down payment? What's going to cost me to repair? What's going to cost? What is my return on investment factor? If I put my hard earned dollar to work, what am I going to get back? Now, if I'm with my wife and she's looking at a Louis Vuitton purse, then I'm thinking, what's the cost factor here? Because <laughs> There's nothing I'm going to get out of that, right? But, but you know, we t need to take a look at. Uh, we need to take a look and evaluate our circumstances. So a lot of people will come to me and they want to learn how to assign contracts. They want to fix and flip. They want to buy and hold rental properties. And it all takes stepping stones to be able to get to the buy and hold side because we need to learn how to create cash before we start building wealth. And so we need to take a look at our own personal budget, our own calculator to figure out what's the cost factor here, what's the return on investment factor. For an example, you know, we all carry this $800 computer in our pocket, right? Do we have to have the newest iPhone every single year? That is a cost factor because I'll tell you what, the iPhone 5 still works just fine, right? Although I got the new one, you know, should put that away. <laughs> but I can afford to get the new one. But, you know, we got to take a look. Can we cut back on, on certain expenses? Like, do you need the biggest data package? Do you need to have si satellite TV? Because all of these little utilities are draining you. They drain you and they take away from the money that you could be using for the return on investment factor, right? I mean, when you get a paycheck, who gets paid first? The government, right? They take their cut first. When you get bills, they get their cut, and whatever's left over is for you. And you need to flip-flop that the other way around and learn how to strategize and structure your business properly so that you always get paid first and they get the leftovers. Amen? Amen. Fantastic. Okay. So these are two questions that you need to take a look at, and you need to figure this out. It's extremely important because she, Christina just mentioned, you know, how do you define wealth? And that's important because I can guarantee the majority of you don't have a def definition of wealth. You're just coming off the top of your head. Having a definition of wealth is going to take some time. It's going to take some thought. It's going to take some planning. You're going to have to put it down on paper, and you're going to have to refine it. Sure, we can make it simple, but is it attainable? Is it sustainable? Can you do it safely? Can you get it done within the next five years or ten years? It's completely up to you. And everybody has a different definition, and nobody was wrong when they're answering you know, the question, what is your definition of wealth? Well, I'll tell you my definition of wealth, it's making money whether I'm working or not. If I'm making sustainable money whether I'm working or not, then I now have options in life. And that's what we're all after. We're all after options, right? Oh, do I want to wash the car during the week and during my job that I'm supposed to be there? Or do I want to do this or do it? It's all about options. And it all starts with planning. You must plan. How many of you heard or read that you must write down your goals? We all have, right? But the question is, do you do it? Most people don't. Most people do not. So you keep it up here, floating around with all the other stuff that you've got going on. And you know what happens? It gets pushed and shoved off to the back. You need to bring it to the forefront so that you're faced with it every single day and have some accountability. 
Black Belt Investors, well that's me. Uh, I am Sensei Gilliland, I own martial arts schools all over LA County. In fact, I got one right down the street in the city of Arcadia, one in Doherty, next door to here. And um, with that, I've been doing it my whole life. I made the Olympic team for 92 and uh, didn't compete, but I made the team. And with that, I just kind of took off doing other things and also uh, getting involved in real estate. You know, I started just like you guys. I started my real estate career back in 1994 at LAX, sitting down at a hotel listening to a guy about fixing and flipping properties. Now, my business, I started my first martial arts school, which I still own today, uh, right out of high school. But that is an after-school evening program. I had my days free. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? There's got to be something else because I just can't sit there and watch Jerry Springer all day, right? So <clears throat> I got to get out there and start figuring out what else do I want to do in life? What can I do? And I, my grandfather is kind of cool because I know a lot of you have heard rich dad, poor dad, but I truly had that. It was like more like, you know, you know, rich, rich grandfather, poor grandfather scenario for me. And my rich grandfather, he was a celebrity. To, I'm sorry. He was an attorney to a lot of celebrities here in California. And he talked about multiple income streams all the time. I had no idea what he was talking about when I was a kid. But now I can go back and look at those conversations and know exactly what he was talking about. And my poor family, you know, there was a lot of rough times throughout my years. I mean, one of the funnest things I ever did with my brother that now lives in Australia for the last 25 years, the funnest thing that we do is on Sunday mornings we get up and we go to Lucky's grocery store, remember Lucky's? And we go dumpster diving because we had to. We had to. Now, to me, it was like Easter egg hunting. It was fun. But I didn't know why until later on, right? And so I had to break that chain in my family because my chain on my mom's side of the family was... Winter's mentality, rob Peter to pay Paul, you know, live on the edge. Who cares if we don't have money? You know, we'll just stress out about it until we get to the next. Who wants to live like that? That's nothing but stress. That's nothing but, but, but emptiness for me personally. So I sat in that chair like you guys. Listen to this guy about fixing and flipping properties. I was already sold before I got there. I am signing up for a course. Cost me 1500 bucks for three days. Took the course, gave me enough information to get my wheels spinning, but never had enough information to get the rubber to meet the asphalt so I can take off. So what did I do? I took my credit card and I swiped my credit card and spent another $32,000, okay? $32,000 back in 1994. A lot of money, right? It's a lot of money today. And back then they didn't have boot camps. They were seminars or workshops. And we were saying that would be a, a class and we would move together going to foreclosure camp and we'd go to, you know, wholesaling. Well, not wholesaling. I didn't really have classes back then about wholesaling. But we would go to tax liens and we would go to, you know, pre-foreclosures, mobile home parks, you know, how to buy them and all this other great stuff, right? And as we moved on to these different seminars, my classmates started dropping off and dropping off until there was just a few of us left. Well, you know, 1995 rolls around, and I'm dating my wife, and it becomes a fiancé. Uh, we are getting plans to, to get married. We move in with each other. We get married. We buy a house. We have a baby. I bought a pre-foreclosure. I fixed it up, and I brought up the equity through sweat equity. I did a cash-out refi and bought my very first fix and flip in Fort Myers, Florida, all in the year of 1995. Who thinks that's a lot? It's just kind of how I roll. You move fast. And so I got my fix and flip. And here's the, here's the thing. I had no idea what I was doing, except for what I was taught in these camps of buying low and selling high. So I went over to Fort Myers, Florida. Why did I go there? Because I couldn't afford to purchase anything here in California. And in California, I had to slap a one in front of it. It was out of my reach. So I go to Fort Myers, Florida. I pick up a $42,000 property. Met with a broker. He helped me purchase the property. It was a pr approved probate. Went over to Fort Myers Bank of America, got a loan. It required 10% down. I had 4200 bucks. They wanted three months worth of savings for mortgage payments. Had that, no problem. Now I'm a proud owner of this piece of junk property that's a probate over in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm already back here in California. Now, we have to rehab. Broker helps me out with the rehab. Find out the bill's going to be a little over $17,000, a little bit more than I expected. Didn't have the money. But I remember listening to my eight tracks that, you know, if I find a good deal, money would come back to me. And I did. I pulled it right out of a credit card. Who thinks it's a good idea to pull money out of a credit card to fix and flip a property? Everybody's shaking their heads now, except for this man right here. Listen, guys, you guys familiar with hard money lenders? Hard money lenders charge more than a credit card does. All a credit card is a hard money lender to me. Okay? That's all it is. You can get 0%, low interest, no points. 
And all I did is I pulled that money out of credit card and I didn't have the money to pay it back, so I transferred over to another credit card next month. And the next month I went over to another credit card. And I had this vicious triangle going on for nine long months. They told me it'd take six months to buy it, fix it, and flip it. Didn't. And I was sweating it out. You know why? Because I didn't even have the money to go fly back to Fort Myers, Florida to see the progress of the property or even see what it looked like turnkey. I was completely on prayer at this point, hoping and wishing and praying that they're doing their job and I'm not going to lose my money because I just got married, just had a baby, just bought a house and all this other stuff. Nine months to my surprise, I, I receive a FedEx envelope. I rip it open. I pull out a check with over a little $9,000 in profits. I did it. I did my first fix and flip. How did I do it? I pushed the F word out of the way of fear and I just went for it. Okay? Figuring out a way, I'll figure out a way to make it work. I'm a type of guy that's more the ready, fire, aim type of guy or sink or swim type of guy. It's just the way I work. It's the way I'm wired. Not everybody's like that. But in a little over $9,000 I made in profits. You know what that means? I sit there and calculate it. It's easy math. I made a little over $1,000 a month in passive income. And all I had to do was basically pick up the remote, push power and play. And it's off and running. Well, you know what it felt like? Dude, I was ecstatic. Number one, all the naysayers saying you couldn't do it, I can now prove them wrong. I just did it. And to me, flipping that first property was just like me eating a can of Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. I had to go over there and start buying more properties. And that's exactly what I did. So I bought more properties. I funneled my way through Alabama to Texas to New Mexico, Arizona, and over here. And finally, back in 1997, 98, I started buying properties in Long Beach, fixing and flipping OYOs, which are condos. With that, in the year 2000, I opened up Black Belt Investors as an education, consulting, and investment property firm. In fact, as far as I know, I'm the second oldest company in California that pipelines out-of-state properties to Californians. And uh, with that, you know, I've run three real estate clubs, cover of uh, Real Estate Wealth Magazine. Yep, that good-looking guy with hair is me. <laughs> Going to be on another magazine cover this coming summer. I'm on, I'm on radio shows at least twice a month forecasting markets. It's not to brag, but it's just to let you know who's up in front of you if you've never heard of me before. Okay? So let's start getting into this. Cash and wealth. We definitely want more of this, right? <laughs> We want cash and wealth. Now, there's a reason why I have cash in front of wealth, and that's because I truly believe that we need to build income streams, multiple income streams, to be able to support our assets that we're going to purchase for wealth building. In fact, one of my oldest domains, my very, one of my first domains ever purchased back in the late 90s is cashandwealth.com. Why? Because when you go to acquire rental properties, do you think it's really that passive like they show you on TV? Is it like the old Ronco commercial, infomercial, where you take that chicken, put it in the oven, set it, forget about it? Absolutely not. It'll burn up. You're going to run to expenses. You're going to have repairs. You're going to have vacancies. You're going to have taxes and insurance. Where's that money going to come from? Strictly from your cash flow? Possibly. But you better have some income streams to support your assets. If not, you know what? That archer is going to come out, pull back his bow, and shoot an arrow right in your assets. It's going to hurt. Did that not happen just you know, a little over 10 years ago? People out there buying properties to build wealth and they were getting interest-only loans, which I'm not opposed to interest-only loans if you know how to use them properly. Negam loans, they are buying pre-construction, full retail value, above retail value, strictly focusing on appreciation, building their wealth empire on sand. And one thing happens, boop, and it becomes quicksand. It all falls apart and loses money. Well, I'm one of those guys. Now, I never had a foreclosure. I'm the type of guy, hey, if I got to make my payment, I make my payment. I figure out a way to do it. However, I had to hold on to properties. I had to hold on to properties until it came up right and then started liquidating. Not a lot of people can do that. And is that a big waste of money? Possibly, but my word's my word. It's just what it is. But if these people here that were building their wealth on sand and they're banking on two income streams, spouse and spouse, and one loses their job, does that put a pinch on their income? Absolutely. So that's why it's so important for you guys as entrepreneurs that you start building income streams. I read an article in Newsweek maybe about five years ago stating that my generation, by the time of retirement, we need at least five solid income streams to be able to live somewhat comfortably. 
because we can't bank on social insecurity. It just can't happen. It's not even going to be around probably when I'm when that age. So you need to start building income streams. That could be, if you're going to focus on real estate, that could be through wholesaling, assigning contracts. That could be, you know, flipping notes. In fact, Paige, that, you, that could be your next month, student of mine. Okay? That could be, that can be fixing and flipping. That can be, you name it. I don't care. I own multiple businesses. I'm not just a real estate guy. I own martial arts. I got a marketing company. I got an auction bidding service. I've got multiple businesses for a reason. Why? Because I understand that market cycles change. Economy changes. And if I'm strictly a real estate agent and the market shifts and it's now 2008, I'm now a real estate agent getting a job at Walmart because I didn't figure out the market. I didn't plan. But if that real estate agent truly understood investing and not just so much retailing, they would have been in business. And if they were able to have some other sort of income stream, they'd probably still be buying properties back in 2009, 10, 11. I mean, how many of you wish you would have bought properties here in Pasadena in 2010? Yeah. Exactly. But why didn't you? Don't answer me, but why didn't you? More likely, likely you, you lost money. Maybe you didn't know about real estate investing. Maybe you had the money and you're just white knuckling it because you're afraid. That fear factor again. So we need to focus on building income streams so that way we can have safe, sustainable wealth building assets in our portfolio. So why real estate? It's an obvious choice, right? It's obvious to me because it's one of the most powerful vehicles out there for wealth building. You can get into other type of investments. You can get into you know, selling computers. You can be in the stock market. You can be in cryptocurrency. You can, I'm not saying one's better than the other. But for me, being a serial entrepreneur, I can tell you right now that real estate is definitely where I sink the majority of my money because it does offer sustainability and it does offer safety. Think about this, guys. Does anybody work at a bank, by the way? Anybody work at a bank? Fantastic. What do you do? Commercial underwriting. Okay, fantastic. Does your department have a, a, a lending department for stocks? No. no. Why? <laughs> Why? Because they're volatile. The banks understand that whether it's a great market like today or a poor market of 2010, that real estate is an asset that they will lend on because it's safe and it's sustainable. It's tangible. But if I walk into Bank of America and say, hey, you know what, dude, I've got the best hot stock tip. I'd like to borrow, they're gonna laugh at me. Why? Because they understand that real estate is one of the best vehicles. It truly offers the trifecta for wealth builders. The trifecta would be cash flow, appreciation, and tax benefits. Those three things right there are the ingredients that you need to build wealth. Not one or the other. You take one of those out and you truly don't have a wealth builder. You have a cash builder or you have a tax savings. You need all three. So we've read and we've heard that 90% of millionaires made their money in real estate. We've heard that before. I believe that to be true and not true. I believe that 90% of these millionaires made their money from something else such as Dell computers, or maybe they own a chain of restaurants, or, I don't know, production studio. They had a cash machine in place building income streams. And then they said, uh-oh, I'm working six months out of the year, and Uncle Sam is my partner taking half. I better start putting my money somewhere else to start sheltering, sheltering my income so I can start building wealth. And then they realized, Oh my gosh, I put money into property and I get tax benefits, I get cash flow, and I get equity through principal pay down and appreciation. So that's why now 90% of your millionaires are putting their money in that direction. But you know what? I've met a handful of billionaires in my life and not one of them, let me back up, they all invest in real estate. They all bank in real estate. They got other things going on, 
But real estate is that slow rolling type of investment. So sometimes it doesn't produce as much cash as quickly as they like, so they have to go towards more of an income stream that's going to do that for them. It's funny because we always hear about the millionaires, but Forbes and everybody else tends to leave out all the billionaires who actually own real estate. Now, the benefits of in, in income property are this. You've got a handful here. Number one, hand, um, it's hard, tangible assets. It's funny because I get a lot of people that uh, say, you know what, I'm a big out-of-state investor, okay? I love to invest in California, but it doesn't make any sense to invest here in California unless I'm flipping properties. So that's all I do here. I sign contracts and I buy, fix, and flip. It's my cash machine. It's my income stream to go buy out-of-state properties, right? Why out-of-state? Because it offers me the trifecta, and that's what I'm looking for. But it's, it's funny because a lot of people will say, you know what? I live here in Pasadena and I can't buy properties in Bakersfield, which Bakersfield is a good place to go buy rental properties and a heck of a lot cheaper than here. Not just Bakersfield, but Barstow too. Any, any city starting with a B in California is pretty darn good, cheap. <laughs> Beaumont, you know, Banning, you name them. So <clears throat> we can find good deals here. In fact, we just acquired a property here in the San Bernardino County just, what, three weeks ago for $46,000. House, $46,000, okay? They're there. But here's the thing. People in Pasadena would say, yeah, I don't want to go all the way out there. It's just too far. I can't drive by and see the rocks grow. <laughs> Why? Because of the big fear factor. It boils down to they don't have a team surrounding them, and they really don't know what they're doing. So they want to invest in their own backyard, but they can't invest in their own backyard because it's too expensive. So they're set there with mattress money, doing nothing, sitting on their hands, on the sidelines, absolutely doing nothing. And then it really freaks them out if I say, well, why don't we go to, you know, Kansas City, Missouri? No, oh, that's just too far. I understand. Well, let me ask you this. By a raise of hands, who in here has invested in their retirement account? Come on, let me see. Oh, more than half of you. 401k, mutual fund stocks. Have you ever seen them? Have you ever sat down at the round table of Coca-Cola with the CEO and talked and put your two cents in? <laughs> but you're willing to do that. That's funny, right? It's just the way it, we think. Real estate, it's too far, but I don't mind giving my money over to Enron. <laughs> see, at least you can get up and, and fly or drive over to your property if you really wanted to see it. You can walk through it, you can touch it, you can smell it, you can taste it. I don't know why you don't want to taste it, but you could. But you can't do that with your stocks, mutual funds, and retirement account. You're extremely passive when it comes to those types of accounts. You are relying 100% on someone else to do the right thing. The only power that you have is to buy in, sell, or trade, and that's it. Then, the other great benefit of real estate is cash flow. That's the buzzword. That's what everybody wants, right? Cash flow. We all want cash flow. We want to build up the cash flow so we can retire and not have to rely on our J-O-B to pull in paychecks. We can do it passively through rental income. Makes sense. But when it comes to investing, guys, there's many people that will run out and buy cheap properties because it looks great on paper and they're going to make a great cash flow. And so when I have investors consulting with me, and I know Christina's run across this, people want to buy cheap properties for the cash flow. You know what that tells me? You want to get away from your J-O-B and switch it out for another J-O-B is what you want. Because if you're strictly focusing on just cash flow because the property doesn't appreciate, that means you don't really have an exit strategy on that property and you're going to be a landlord for life. So if you needed to sell or if you wanted to sell, good luck. Who are you going to sell it to? and you get stuck. I've had so many investors come to me saying, oh, okay, I'll just knock them, Detroit, okay? So many investors will say, I bought Detroit properties. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> I've told you guys not to buy over there. Now, I'm not saying all Detroit's bad because it's not. But when it comes to investing, guys, what's important, if you truly want the cash flow, which comes along with having an exit strategy, you need to invest in markets that are, have um, diversification in, in their economy not a linear economy. So for those of you in here that are a little bit older and you understand that you've gone through a couple of real estate cycles or economic cycles, how many times has the automotive industry crashed? Don't tell me, but it's been a lot. 
and they always get bankrupt, and then they get bailed out, right? So why would you go and invest in a town that has one thing writing for them? It doesn't make sense. The only people that are in Detroit are the people that can't get out of Detroit. Now, Detroit's doing extremely well right now, okay? Why? Because people are loosening up their hands, they're not white-knuckling money anymore, and they're buying cars. But when that changes, the automotive industry comes to a stop, Everybody's laid off again. You go through that same cycle over and over again. So we have to focus on diversification in economies because that will allow us an exit strategy to dump the property if we need to. Now, coming to passive income. We are no longer calling it passive income. Are we going to call it passive income anymore? No, no because it's nothing passive about owning rental properties. If you think it's going to be passive like that Ronco infomercial, you got another thing coming, you're going to lose your portfolio. It is work. Now, it's not a nine to five job. It's not even a part time job. Depending on how many properties you own, that would require you maybe a couple of hours a month. And you know what? The best thing you can ever do when you start acquiring residual income properties is always seek counselor. Find a counselor. Find a consultant. I only know two in the good room here. Oh, like Christina's eyebrows go up. <laughs> right? You go seek her. Let her help you. Find people that have been there, done that. So that way you don't take those arrows in the assets. And you sustainly and safely build up your residual income. This is true long wealth building. Look, everybody comes to me because of flipping properties and out-of-state properties. I've done over 14,000 flips, okay? Now, I've made my life career basically focusing flipping properties. Flipping properties to end buyers, flipping properties to other investors. You know, those are my two buyers. And so, with that, I understand. I don't care how many properties you flip, you'll never be wealthy. Never. You'll be cash rich. You'll have some great money to go put spinning rims on your Pinto, but you're not going to be wealthy. It's a job. It's an income stream. But with every few flips you do and you're making pr pretty darn good money, you take some of that money and you go buy an investment property, free and clear or with a, with a mortgage against it, and get it going. You flip, 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 and then go buy a rental. And now you're building your cash and wealth system in place. Tax benefits are huge, okay? Most of my white collar professionals love to buy real estate strictly for the tax benefits. They've got a huge income stream. Maybe they're a brain surgeon, an attorney, or something like that, and they've got a lot of money coming in. But they need to do something with it. And so they go after the tax benefits that real estate has to offer. Now, they're starting to slowly get chipped away every year, starting to slowly get chipped away, right? And we just had another big one for homeowners here. You know, you can only write off so much money on your, your mortgage interest, but it's still the number one real estate or number one investment vehicle that allows us to take multiple tax deductions. So I, I think Christina said it, but I heard someone say, hey, you know, you're always looking at real estate, right? So I was up in Santa Clara this past weekend. I was uh, speaking at an event on uh, Saturday, then I was in uh, San Jose speaking at another event, uh, talking about completely different topics. But what you know is is that is that a business transaction? Is that a is that a write-off, a tax deduction for my business to do that? Absolutely, right? Because it's ordinary and necessary in my profession to go up to certain areas and speak about real estate investing. Now, do you think I slipped a little fun in there? Absolutely. You got to balance it out. Life's all about balance, right? So with that, I take my wife. We go. Has anybody ever been to Portola or um, Capitola Beach? Gorgeous. Oh, beautiful, beautiful beach. Just below Santa Cruz, right? So we get a bed and breakfast. We're right on the ocean. I mean, just right, right there. We're on the ocean. Perfect. Now, is that a business trip or is that vacation now? Business, trip. Both. business both. She doesn't know. I live my life as a proactive tax deduction, and so should you. Listen, law says that for at least six and a half hours a day, I must be looking at real estate. Well, when I was sitting in that lounge chair looking out at the ocean, 
That doesn't count. But when I look to my left and I look to my right, I'm looking at real estate. <laughs> right? So of course you're going to document and you're going to have a good paper trail so that you can also start taking advantage of the tax benefits. You got, you know, you've got a, a slew of things with travel and meals and somewhat of entertainment and you've got any expense against the property and tax and all the other great stuff. But when you start putting all of this stuff together, now you start to feel that residual end of freedom. Time on your side, if you want the time on your side. Not everybody wants that. But you have the option to choose whether you're going to sit on the beach or you're going to do some work or what I always call a workcation. So I don't know about you guys, but I love vacation. <laughs> And I love traveling. I've been fortunate enough to be, be to the 29 different countries. I, I absolutely love traveling. And so with that, you know, when I take my kids, they're like, okay, let's go for another workcation. Now, I'm not a big extravagant, uh, extravagant traveler. I don't like to take two weeks off at a time. Who can take two weeks off at a time when you're running a business? It's kind of tough, you know? <laughs> but I always turn my vacations into workcations cool thing about real estate is I can do it anywhere. I don't have to be in the office. I can literally be on the beach on my laptop doing stuff or Disneyland. We just got back from Florida. We were there for a week and a half. And with that, I'm walking around Animal Kingdom once an hour, check into my phone, boom, get some things done, done. Standing in line for Avatar, that new thing there. And you know, no, it was three hours. It's three hours, but you know what? DocuSign, sign documents, boom, done. <laughs> Put it away. Okay? That's the cool thing about real estate. And the, cool, the other cool thing is I'm able to take my family. A lot of people in here can do that as well. It's not a bragging right. But I've earned it. I've worked it. And you've worked for it as well. And if you're not at that point, then get there. Get some help to get there. All right. Donald Trump. Like him or hate him, I don't really care. But the point of Donald Trump being up here is that we're definitely going to have some big changes in this country. He's been here for one year and we've already had some big changes. Some good, some bad. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I can tell you what. Right now, I mean, the stock market's been pretty darn good for a solid year. Things have been up. Real estate still looks good. There's not one single indicator showing that we have a bubble coming anytime soon. Not one. whether it's going to be locally here in California, across the United States, or this global economy that we're fighting with and working with on a daily basis. Should this stop me from investing? No, but a lot of people put on the brakes and stop investing because they're afraid of what's going to happen with the economy. Look, no one has a crystal ball. I don't care who you are. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right now, i got to do what I need to do today so I can set up my future. Now, when is the right time? When's the best time to invest in real estate? Low market, high market, medium market, today, yesteryear? For me, it's always. I don't care what time of year, what time of day, what time of cycle we're in. As long as I buy right, I'm okay. So let's take a look at this simplistic real estate cycle. This is the quadrant. It gets more complex than this, but it's pretty darn easy to understand here. We have four cycles. We have the expansion stage, the oversupply stage, the recession recovery, okay? So basically, right now, we're in the expansion stage. How do I know that? Because there's not very many properties in the MLS. Uh, we've got home builders pulling permits like crazy to build new homes in, in the outskirts of LA, Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside County. And so we're completely in the expansion stage right now. There'll be coming a time where things start to slow down and these home builders are going to end up having an oversupply and then our MLS is going to be flooded with properties. We saw that, right? Here we are in, in uh, late 90s all the way up to 2006 and then we start trickling over here in 2007, 2008, right? And then when boom, 2008, 9, we're in this recession. And then we pull right out of it in the, rec in the recovery stage. We always go through this cycle. This great, uh, great Recession didn't make this up. This has always been here. But the important thing as a real estate investor is that you treat real estate investing as if you're a Navy SEAL. 
Navy SEAL are the biggest badasses out there, guys. Hands down. We don't treat it as if we're a, a bullet sponge in the Army on the front lines. That's where everybody got hurt, right? Oh, everybody's a millionaire in investing in 2005. Look at me. I've got 20 properties all on interest-only negative amortization loans. Woohoo! And a little thing happens like a pink slip gets handed to a spouse, and you're in trouble. Well, that's your grunt in the Army. That's the one that's not specializing in tactics. We want to specialize in tactics. So let me, let me give you an example. Back in 2007, I hired a company out of Chicago to come into my company to do an internal audit. I knew, we all knew, that's been around for a while, that you know, this is going to bust. And so with that, I needed them to seal up all the cracks of my vase so I wasn't leaking money or anything like that, right? They did a pretty good job. And of course, I leaked some money here and there like every other business does. But I survived. And one of the things that they did back then is in 2007, we had 123 real estate clubs in Southern California. That's a lot. It's a lot. Today we have more. <laughs> we have more due to meetup, right? So we have more real estate clubs today. But in 2007, we had 123 real estate clubs. Two of them were mine. 2008 comes around, middle of 2008, we are down to nine. Two of them are mine. Why did people like Phyllis or Sam, myself, and others survive this right here? Because we're not a linear investor. We didn't focus just strictly on retail. We didn't just focus on wholesale. We adapted like a Navy SEAL did and we, we pushed through and we made it. And that's what you need to be as a real estate investor. I'm not saying, hey, go be a jack of all trades and a master of none. none. I'm not saying to do that. You need to learn a niche that you need to get to the next step. And when you master that niche, it's okay to add on another. Okay? So don't be a dabbler. Don't be a, a hobbyist because last time I checked, hobbies don't pay any money. Now here's the, another look at the cycle, but this is on the bell curve. It's still the same, same levels here. And I mentioned earlier that um, we're in the expansion stage. And each cycle here has three stages. And which stage do you think we're in Southern California? One, two, or three? One, two? Mm. How do you know? How do you know? It's a guess, right? Look, we're in Los Angeles County. That's not one market. There's many micro markets out there. See, and people skip over this. But if we were to dump them all into one bucket, then yes, we can, we can say we're definitely in the expansion stage, and you know what? We're probably right about a quarter of the way through this, the third level here. Why? Prices are starting to slow down just a tad. Got a little bit more properties on the market than just two years ago. Why is that? My thinking is because of the affordability factor. It's not affordable for most people. Hence the reason why you have a lot of builders like KB and everybody else building on the outskirts like in Apple Valley or Banning and Beaumont and Corona and places like that where you know, it's a little bit more affordable, right? But does that mean we're going to plateau off and stay here? Maybe. Don't know. Don't have a crystal ball. Does that mean we're going to fall down? Eventually. But when? Well, most, most forecast um, experts state that by the year 2020 is where we're going to kind of start, you know, holding tight. Not really sure if it's going to go up or down, but again, there's no indicator except the affordability factor. People can't afford to buy in Pasadena, the majority of people. They can't afford to buy in Downing, where I grew up, the majority of people, which is less than Pasadena. You can go to low-income neighborhoods like Compton and Linwood and Watts, where now it's a kind of mixture of low-income, working class, and some middle income, but it's still expensive. It's amazing, right? Well, here's the psychology of everybody's thinking, right? So back here, let's start with optimism. I started my career in real estate investing, learning in 95, really invested in, I'm sorry, 94, invested in 95. We were just pulling out of a recession at that time, right? But right around 97, 98 is when we started seeing a glimpse of light and the short sales started going away. 
Well, you know what? Uh, optimism kicked in right around 2000, 2001. We went through some excitement because now Rich Dad comes out and real estate's doing well, and it's 2003, euphoria. We're up here like 2006 now. Oh my gosh, my house has tripled in value. I am rich on paper. I'm doing extremely well. And then, uh oh, something feels a little funny, a little butterflies, kind of like rolling up that roller coaster there. And you're thinking, oh, what's coming next? And you start getting the butterflies. Well, 2008 rolls around. People get nervous, start to panic, liquidate. Low modification companies come out like crazy. Everybody is desperate. Hmm. If you're a wholesaler, that's the time to hit them hard. But down here in 2010 was the deepest part of our recession. And then we started bouncing back. And here we are again today, right there, optimism. Does that mean we're going to go up here past this part here? Well, we're already basically at that level right now. Some areas a little bit higher, some a little bit lower. Let's take a look at the monthly house price index for the United States. This is from 1991 to present time. In fact, it just came out, I think, uh, January 2017. Yeah, January 2017. I know you can't read. So it says 1991, January, all the way to January 2017. And what do we see that's going on here in regards to house price? Price also meaning appreciation, right? So we start out here and we just, basically we had that recession. It was known as the greatest recession back in 1990. But then our Great Recession really kicked into place in 2008. So this was the second uh, biggest uh, downtime in our history back in 1990, uh, opposed to the Great Depression. And what did we do? We just started riding this roller coaster riding up. Now think about it, me, guys. As a real estate investor starting in 1994 right here, dude, I am the world's best real estate investor of the whole wide world. Nothing goes wrong, right? And, I, and it's not just me. Everybody else was thinking the same thing because a lot of people started jumping on the bandwagon right about here, right? Right in 2003, they started jumping on the bandwagon. We're just the best. And the next thing is, shoop, uh-oh. A lot of people lost their whole portfolio or lost their retirement. And now they're on, you know, taking whatever retirement's left over, putting it in steroids to try to recapture what they lost. But down for a short period of time, and this was a short period of time, although it felt like a long period of time. It was a short period of time. Look, we have five diamond states in the United States, California, Nevada, Arizona, Texas, and Florida. Proven historically that we will have the best appreciation, the most demand for houses. It will uh, also crash the hardest when we hit a recession, but we also bounce back the fastest. And if you think about the triangular uh, areas of Phoenix, uh, let's say Phoenix, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas, we got this triangle, right? And back in 2005, 2006, dude, we were appreciating like crazy. I mean, Shoot, Phoenix got up to 51% appreciation. Unheard of. And the crash happens. And those three areas get hit the hardest besides Florida. Florida was another one that got hit extremely hard. And what city bounced back the fastest? Phoenix, California, then Vegas. Why? Diversification in the economy. Diversification in the economy. The real estate market crashed extremely hard in the Phoenix area. But the economy didn't crash very hard. In fact, they've been the number one economy in the United States for the last eight years. This is trailing 12 months the average of the annualized number of new homes sold in the United States from 1975 to August 2017. This is about new houses being built and sold. And if we go over here to 1975, here we are about 550 right there. And you can see it going up and down, peaks and valleys, right? Um, but we come all the way across and we're basically right here, 2017. The same as 1975. This means compared to 2000, and take this line straight down, 2005 was the peak time for new construction. You know what that means? We have a gap from here to there. We have room to build and get back up to there. And the affordability factor in these areas are key because a lot of people are moving out there and starting to build up cities and making them a little bit more diversified in these small little economies and purchasing these properties. So the United States real estate values keep rising. In fact, did you know in 1626 Manhattan was purchased for 26 bucks? You knew that? Holy smokes, what are you, Wikipedia? Yes. <laughs> 
20, 20, 24 bucks. 24, what can you buy? And I was just there recently. All I got was a, roast, or a, a pastrami sandwich for $22 and, and tax. And you can buy Man Ant for 24 bucks. It's pretty crazy, right? But values keep going up, real estate keeps going up, and what follows that is rents. Think about the rental market, guys. When we had our Great Recession, property values dropped drastically. In fact, in my neighborhood where I live, I, I'm out in the Riverside County area, it was one in 18 houses that were vacant. It's a lot, right? It's a good thing for me, but bad for everybody else. It's a lot. But when people lost their half a million, three quarter million, one million dollar home, the values went down, but did the rents go down? Rents went up. Why? Because they went from a $5,000 mortgage payment coming over and renting a property for 2,500 bucks, right? So rents were up. They kept going up and going up. The only time historically in the last 100 years that rents dipped was back in the 40s, and it dipped like 27, or I'm sorry, $47. On average, $47. But from all up to that time in the 40s and then past the 40s, it's it never dipped down. Strictly going up. Well, we're becoming a renter's nation. I don't know if you know history, but if you go back and look at ancient times like Greece and Egypt, and then you go to the western side of Europe, everybody owned property. But then when things, when their economy, where they're no longer a, a, you know, a one first world economy type of going on, being rich, they had to consolidate. And families started moving into their parents' house. You know, young Joe and young Mary had to move in with mom and dad, right? And then their estate gets passed over generation after generation. Why? Affordability factor. Prices got so high, so out of whack that they couldn't afford to do so. So they had to rent or they had to move back home and live as a small commune. Well, we're seeing that again today here in the United States. When the recession hit, what happened? Families started moving in with each other. They even got bigger houses, but they'd have two or three families living in one sharing the rents is what they were doing. Very common today. In fact, home ownership fell to a 51-year low back in 2016. Now we're just at 62% home ownership when we were much, much higher than that in America. And this tends to keep falling just a tad. Why? A lot of different factors, which I'm not going to get into. But one is commitment. Millennials, sorry millennials in here, but you don't like to commit. Why? Because you saw your parents go through hell during the recession, and you're like, ooh, I'm not going to do that. You know? Not only that, millennials don't like to commit because they're more mobile. They move around more often. Tech world. They're in Cincinnati. They're in Austin. They're in you know, Silicon Valley. So they don't want a mortgage. They want to be able to bounce around. What's that? Absolutely. What are you reading my slides? I got that on here. <laughs> wages are hampering affordability. Look, your wages, my wages can't keep up with the sales prices. It's very hard to keep up with the rents. And then student loan is out of control. Right? That's one of the big topics in, in the de presidential debates is student loans. How are we going to get away from that? Well, credit scores are expected to decline as well because now we're kind of coming up to a, you know, somewhat of a, res of a peak. And not only that, we've got many people here that picked up interest-only loans back in 2007, and they were for interest-only loans were 3, 5, 7, 10, 15 years. 10-year mark hit 2017. Many people were holding on to these loans, did nothing about it, and uh-oh, it's now triple the payment, and we had a little spike in foreclosures. You gotta know that so you can capitalize on that if you're gonna be able to flip properties, right? Big funds and bankers currently making more on renters capital nation. Yeah, believe it or not, guys, those really big hedge fund buyers, those really big guys on Wall Street, they have a vision, they have a plan, and you're not part of knowing that vision and plan, but you're a part as a stepping stone for them. They want you to fail. They want you to fail so they can go harvest the crops. You go buy retail, 
and something happens and you got to sell wholesale or you lose your house and they come harvest. Isn't that what the hedge fund buyers just did? And they'll do it again. I don't know what it is about Americans, guys. I mean, we are still the number one country in the United States, or in the, yeah, in the United States, that's good. Huh? <laughs> number one country in the world where foreigners want to move to. Number one, still. Why? Opportunity. And it's amazing to me that foreigners know how to invest better than Americans that were born and raised here. They truly do. Think about it. Back in the late 80s, I was a loan originator for Bank of America. Did you know Bank of America, when you wanted to go in to get your a loan for a primary residence, you had to put 10% down, maybe 20%. Your interest rates were between 18 and 22%. Ooh, yeah. And people complain, oh my gosh, I got 4% today. <laughs> Money's cheap. Take advantage of it. 18, 20, and you know what? People are picking up these loans like hotcakes. And then we hit the recession. But when we hit the recession, who bought all of California and Hawaii? Japan did, exactly. They own Hawaii. They came in and said, oh, look at these guys, bozos. In Japanese, called kazo, bozo. And they said, these guys buy retail. Why? Because they want to hold their Starbucks coffee. You know, it's important to have that logo on there and pay five bucks when they can go to 7-Eleven and get a better cup of coffee. Right? They want to walk around with that Nordstrom's bag because, you know, oh my gosh, it's a Nordstrom's bag. It's extremely, you know what, you know what really sells the iPhone, guys? The box. The box sells the iPhone. It's that darn box. And most iPhone owners still have that box somewhere in their closet. We like bling. And so we pay retail for it. And foreigners wait for us to mess up, and they come in and buy. Now, we had a great recession. Who came in and buy during the great recession? What is it about these Asians? <laughs> they come in and they buy everything up. Good for them. Honestly, good for them. They know how to invest. They know how to capitalize. They understand the power of leverage. And they're not afraid to invest overseas. Here's U.S. home ownership rates right now. This is done by the Federal Reserve. This is back in uh, January of 1984, all the way up to the end of 2016. Look at that. We are below what it was back in 1984. So what am I, why am I telling you this? Not to go buy a home? To go buy a home? No, renters, they're filling my properties. They are filling my, you have a choice. You're on this side of the fence or you're on this side of it. Who believes in here that this country is truly divided and there's breaking up the middle income area and you're either going to be poor or rich? Isn't that what happened in, in England? Isn't that what happened in, in uh, France? Isn't that what happened over in Egypt and all those other countries? And we're following suit. And you need to decide which side you're going to be on. Are you going to be on the side where you're going to be renting a property from us or are you going to be renting it to someone else? Decide. And decide soon. Because you're going to look back and you're going to kick yourself and say, I should have done that a year ago. And you're probably already doing that now. There's plenty of things I kicked myself about saying, gosh, I should have done that last year. And I didn't. Interest rates are way down. We know, right? As I just mentioned, Bank of America in 89 when I was working for them. But here you can see, cheap money. Very, very cheap money. So if you have the ability to acquire a loan as long as you can pay it back, <coughs> then grab it. Think about this, guys. I talked about retirement earlier, right? Who remembers when you would work at a job and your employer would put in a dollar if you put in a dollar? They would match your dollar. That's a great, who, well, that's great. I love that, right? Wrong. Go to a bank. Mark, ask Mark. You go to, if I go to Mark and say, hey, you know what? I want to borrow money for a commercial building. What's your typical down, uh, percentage down payment? 20, 30%? Uh, Just average. Okay, 20%, right? So you know what Mark says? I'll tell you what, Sensei, you put in $2, I'll put in 8 Different way of looking at it, isn't it? Wait a minute, I, I put in $2, and you put in 8 and I have the full value of the property, and I only put in 20%? Done deal. As long as you can pay it back, as long as you got the right property, they can put off that cash flow to make the mortgage payment. Okay? Build the income streams. Okay, now this is the um, house price index for the United States. Again, what do we have in common here? Real estate goes up, right? 
Sure, we'll hit our hiccups, but we'll get over it. Now, who got hurt during this time? Who got hurt? People that got bad loans, number one. And the other investor were the fix and flippers. They would buy pre-construction, full retail, hold that hot potato, six months, let it appreciate, throw the hot potato to someone. Whoever got the hot potato lost. Fix and flippers. Strictly focusing on appreciation, which is the riskiest way to invest, by the way. You never invest solely on appreciation. Bad, bad, bad idea. And that's got hurt. But if you bought a property with the right loan at the right price, you know, in here, and you held it and it cash flowed, <coughs> would you be okay today? Absolutely. Why? Because it cash flowed. You're not really worried about the value. Even if you bought it at the peak, you bought it at the peak and it cash flowed. Well, did rents go down? No, rents went up. But if you go straight across, are you okay today? Absolutely, because you are investing for wealth building and you've got the residual income to cover whatever necessary and ordinary expenses you have. Are you guys familiar with Benjamin Graham? Yeah. Ben oh, good, one person. <coughs> Benjamin Graham, well, most people don't know who he is. Benjamin Graham, okay, you should write that down. Benjamin Graham, that's Warren Buffett's mentor. That's Warren Buffett's mentor. Think he's a pretty smart guy? If Warren Buffett's, you know, learning from this guy. And he writes the book, The Intelligent Investor, and he says this. In the financial markets, hindsight is forever 2020, but foresight is legally blind. And thus, for the most investors, market timing is a practical and emotional impossibility. You know what he's saying? He's saying invest, 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 invest. Do it right, though. Do it right. Make sure you have it. You know your exit strategy before you enter. Make sure that you got your bases covered. And invest. Doesn't matter where we at in the real estate cycle. Just invest right, because we always make our money on the purchase, not on the sale, guys. Okay. So the time is now to invest. So I'm going to propose the 2010 plan. The 2010 plan means this. 20, the 2010 plan means this. You buy 20 houses in the next 10 years. If you can't do that, then you buy 10 houses in the next 20 years. I don't really care. Just get it going. But if you can focus two properties per year, whether you're paying all cash or doing a joint ventureship or you're coming in with a loan, get it going. And you'll be amazed at what happens to your financial portfolio. So what would 20 rentals do for you? Think about it. If we were to buy, and I'm going to promote out of state just because, honestly, we, we can't afford to buy here. Nothing really makes sense here. Cap rates, if you don't know what a cap rate is, capitalization rate, it's a way to measure the income on an investment property. Cap rates are extremely low, if not negative, in some areas. But if we are able to pick up properties that cash flow, a true net cash flow of $500 a month, we multiply that by 20. That's $10,000 in monthly income. Can we live off of $10,000 in monthly income? Okay, half of you, the other half are greedy, so double it up. <laughs> double it up. I honestly cannot, personally, I cannot live off of $10,000 a month. I'd be in the hole. That's because of what I'm running today. But that means I gotta really inject some steroids and get this thing going, right? If you had $10,000 a month in residual income, you got $120,000 at the end of the year. We're doing pretty darn good. Now you have the ability, and I'm not saying quit your job, combine the two so you can go buy more, right? Get it stabilized, get it performing, and start putting some options into your life. That's $10,000 a month. That's $120,000 a year. That's $1.2 million in 10 years. It's pretty good, right? So I know you can't really see, but let me give you an example. So here's a house, right? Cute little house. Doesn't have to be the best house in the neighborhood, 
but it's got to be functional. It's got to be safe. It's got to be code compliant. It has to be desirable. Desirable for you as an investor, desirable to a tenant, and desirable to the next buyer because eventually you're going to sell it. Because you might sell this and come over here to Pasadena and buy properties when the recession happens. See? We use this as a stepping stone. And so here are some numbers to give you an idea. Not for sale, okay? Just an idea. Purchase price, $58,000. Now, some of your cars in here are more than that, right? But this appreciates and your car does not. This spits out cash, your car does not. You gotta pay cash. Pulls in $950 a month in rents. These are, look, when you're looking at uh, properties, make sure it's a true net because a lot of investment firms will leave out vacancy, they'll leave out management, and they'll leave out maintenance to make this number look much more grand. But these are mandatory, necessary to plug in. So now you're making $6,400 and some chump change in one year's term. Not a whole lot of money, but that's basically $500 a month, right? Well, start multiplying that. Maybe it's in Phoenix. Maybe you don't want to go so far away, but you want to go somewhere close. It's only, you know, six hour drive for me, most people seven hours, plane ride 45 minutes. Now, Phoenix, again, great economy, diversified, very important, great exit strategy, but now you're gonna pay a little bit more in the Phoenix market, $120,000. Use the power of leverage like I mentioned earlier, put down 20%. You put in $2, the bank gives you $8, right? So now you got a down payment $2,400. This pulls in a little over $1,000 a month in rents. You net it all out, you're only making $2,300 a month, or a year, sorry. And not bad, but this may not be a lot of money, but this is not including the tax deductions you get. It's not including the equity that you're building in it or getting it self-built by appreciation. But you take this number right here and divide it into this number right here and you get 9.6% cash on cash return. That's, I don't know where you're earning that. What's your bank account earn? What is the savings account? I don't even know. What is the savings account earn? Point zero, one. Point zero wrong. You, then you gotta figure in deflation, inflation, and taxes. You're negative. You're losing money if it's sitting there, right? That's not very smart. This is kind of cool. So you can find calculators online, but I got a really simple one just to kind of give you an idea of the power of appreciation. If we were to take a $100,000 property and instead of saying an interest rate, we just say a nominal appreciation rate because historically, from the Great Depression to today's date, appreciation has been between six and a half and seven percent, whatever analysis company you're going to, all right? But let's just use five percent. You have your hundred thousand dollar property at an appreciation rate of five percent over the next thirty years. You know what that hundred thirty thousand or hundred thousand dollars turns into? It turns into four hundred thirty-two thousand dollars. You've just made a $332,000 off of a very small investment that maybe only cost you $20,000 to purchase. Hmm. Multiply that by 20. Those numbers should be getting you excited. They should be getting you excited. They should make your, your brain spin and start getting those butterflies in you like, hey, I got to get this going. I need to go see Christina get some consultation. I need to find properties here in California or maybe out of state. I don't care where you buy, just buy right, get consultation and do it now. 120,000 and then over the next 30 years, $8.6 million in real estate. That's crazy numbers for some of you. Scaling back to 1995, I said, oh yeah, right. Mm -mm kind of cool because I'll share this with you. Again, not bragging, but live transactions. On the way over here, it took me two hours to get here. An hour and 58 minutes. I timed it. I was upset. <laughs> hour and 58 minutes to get here. But on my way here, I got an offer on a property of mine for $2.5 million. What am I in it for? Just under a million. Yes. Okay. I did not do it alone. I can't take all the credit. A colleague found the deal. Another colleague was boots on the grounds that put a lot of stuff together. I found the money. Get this, kind of cool, I'll share with you, okay? Because I just sold it, so it's no big deal. So I bought a tax lien for $350,000. 
Florida company bought this property, and they, and, and they bought it for $250,000 and did nothing with it. Slumlord was running it. I got it for $350,000. And then I, uh, we had to file a foreclosure on it. So we had to fill out all the paperwork. This is September now, September 2016. File the paperwork. We had to go from September all the way to May 2017 to actually get awarded the property. We foreclosed it, and now it's ours. With that, we've got a lot of repairs into the property. Everything's now being optimized. You know, it nets just about $300,000 per year. So now I'm in this tug of war. Do we keep it? Do we sell it? Do we keep it? Do we sell it? I mean, gosh, $300,000 a year. It can make about, you know, 20 something, $30,000 a month off this net. Pretty darn good money, right? But that 1.5 is killing me, you know, because what can I do with that money? Go do another one because I got more lined up. See, cash machine. You flip some, you hold one. Flip some, you hold one. So where do I get the money? Where do you get the money? Well, here's the thing. Some of you have cash on hand right now, and it's earning you nothing. You're losing valuation on it right now. So you need to put it to use. Whether you're going to be flipping properties, maybe you're going to be a, a, you know, a private money lender, maybe you're going to invest in a note, maybe you're going to go buy yourself a rental property. Okay? You have 401ks and IRAs that can be utilized. You know that? And it won't hurt you if you set them up self-directed. I would definitely say probably the busiest services out there are your retirement custodians that are converting these regular old 401ks and IRAs into self-directed. Go on solo 401k or self-directed or self-directed IRAs. Why? Because the baby boomers lost a big chunk of their money and they realized that they got to get it going again and they're sinking it into real estates. Then you have existing equity in maybe your house, maybe a second home, maybe in a car that you own. Many people have cars and boats that they own free and clear that's boats sitting in the garage doing nothing. Sell it and put it to work or cash out refi it. Okay? Creative structuring. Sold plenty of deals this last year, 2017, on owner financing. Loans and lines of credit. They're starting to loosen up the criteria a little bit. If you can capture money, then go do so. PayPal is now offering unsecured loans. You know that? Yes. So I just, you know, so last year, PayPal, when they first came out with it, they gave me $15,000, kind of a trial run. Very, very cheap money, by the way. December, they gave me $75,000. Very, very cheap money. I didn't have to qualify. Had to have a PayPal account. Okay? Make more money. Figure it out. We all need to hustle in here, okay? Here's a great quote by Zig Ziglar. Success occurs when opportunity meets preparation. Not by luck. I tell everybody. People tell me, hey, good luck, sensei. And I always say, luck is for people who don't know what they're doing. I'm not lucky, okay? So let me go through this retirement plan. It's pretty simple. It's very easy to follow along. Would you mind hitting the lights just for me one more time? Thank you just so that everybody can see the numbers, because I don't know if it's going to show up bright enough or not. Thank you. All right, so really easy. Let's say we've got, let's just work on five properties, okay? We'll work on five properties. Here's how it works. Let's say, for instance, we got property A. Purchase price is $80,000, rents is $850 a month, right? Then you have your loan payment, which is principal and interest. You have your taxes and insurance. So your total expense every month is $507. You take that and you deduct it from the 850, and then that means you're earning $343 per month. Fantastic, I get to pay my cell phone bill, okay? Now, property B. We pick up a property uh, that's $48,000, produces $950 a month in rents. You got your expenses again, which kicks out to be $442. You minus that from your 950 a month in rents, and you're making a little bit more money with this property, okay? A little bit more performing. Maybe this property here, well, I can tell you, I know what the properties are. This is an Indianapolis property here, and this property is a Cleveland property there. Now, we got uh, the third property. Purchase price is 100000 This is actually a Phoenix property. Pulls in $900 a month in rents. You got your loan payments on it, your insurance, a little over uh, almost $640 a month. Minus that, you're pulling in $261. And then we have property D, and this is $52,000, $1,100 a month in rents. Yes, we can get 
$1,100 properties at $1,100 a month in rents. Cash flow here is going to be $635, the best producing property so far. And our final property is $75,000. That was Cleveland. This one here is $75,000. This one's actually in Kansas City, Missouri. $825 a month in rents. And you got your expenses. Now you're netting here $338 a month. Well, if we take all five of those properties and we add up the cash flow, we're making a little over $2,000 a month. Would that help you guys every single month to make an extra two grand a month? Yeah. Absolutely, right? So who's happy with that? Yeah, look at that, half the class, shame on you. Think bigger, guys. Okay, now instead of spending the money on material items like, you know, stereos, so that you can listen to your country rap, maybe you wanna think about, you know, taking that monthly income and then putting it back right into the mortgage and pay that thing down. Mortgages are typically how many years? 30. We all know what mortgage means in Latin, right? Defined definition means to death. Okay? So we want to kick that to the curb real quick. So let's say we've got that $2,085 every single month and we apply it to the very first mortgage. And so let's say, for instance, this is now Bank of America with this property here. We take all that cash flow and we attack the principal of that loan. Well, that's the uh, reminder there. It's pulling in, eight, um, it's an $80,000 property. But we attack the principal on that loan at Bank of America. You know what ends up happening? By applying that $2,085 each and every month, your mortgage it will not be paid off in 30 years. It'll be paid off in five years, eight months. That's huge. Power number, guys. Now, what happens? We get rid of that loan, right? You own the property free and clear. So your income is now boost to $24.69 each and every month. So now we're going to take that amount and apply it to the next loan. So we now take that roughly $2,500. We go to Wells Fargo, say, hey, I'm tired of you being a ball and chain around my ankle. So we go to that loan and we get rid of that right there by attacking the principal again. You know what ends up happening? Well, we now got that property paid off in nine years. We now have two properties paid off within nine years versus 30. And that now kicks us just under three grand a month. And you guys were happy with two. Now we do exactly the same thing. We own two free and clear properties. We have three properties left with mortgages. We take all that cash flow. I was going to say WAMU, but WAMU is not around anymore. But um, some other bank, okay? So it's Chase. There you go, Chase. And so now we get rid of Chase. In 11 years, you own three properties free and clear, boosting that income up just to be a little over $3,300 per month. Do the same thing for D. And with applying that, we are now at 13 years, five months, owning four properties, free and clear, almost making $4,000 per month. And then we go to the last property, property E. And we go back to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, US Bank, whoever it is, and we kick them to the curb. You know what ends up happening? We have all five properties paid off in about half of the time of that normal mortgage. If you wrote it out like most people do, what happens? You're going 30 years, it's still 2,000 bucks. Now we're at half the time, 15 years, eight months, making double that. Well, we just really increased our ROI, did we not? 15 years, eight months, we now own five properties free and clear. The results are this. No longer making 2,000, you're making $4,000 per month. Now, we never took in consideration over that 15 years, eight months, rent increases. You think rents will go up within 15 years time? But I didn't figure that in there. I'm keeping it simple. What about tax sheltering, getting money back on our properties, right? What about the appreciation? What do we have in this right now? Roughly 100 grand for five properties? Somewhere right around there? About 100 grand. 100 grand gets you these five properties free and clear with $4,000 a month plus the rental increases. So if we took the five properties and we total them up, you're at $355,000 in assets on the purchase side, right? But using the national average of 7%, well, we just take that, that asset, we multiply it by 7%, we made just under $25,000 in equity through appreciation that year. So then we add it up, and now your property is worth three, almost 380. Now we do that over the next upcoming years. Well, five years, you now have a half a million dollars worth of real estate. In 10 years, you now have almost $700,000 worth of real estate. 
16 years, when you have them all paid off, you have now broken the million dollar mark. Don't get too excited about a million dollars, guys, because a million dollars is not much today. Remember the million dollar movie? We used to get all excited about that. Remember that? But not much today, but probably a lot more than what most of us have in there in the bank account right now. But shoot, uh, 10 years later, we're over at $2, two million dollar mark. Come on, guys, that's pretty darn good. It, even if we're at the $15 million mark right here with five properties, but if we did 20 and we stuck to the plan, what's that worth now? What's that worth? Come on, simple math, guys. Five yeah, five times. Right? We now we are at the position of we have options in life. We've got whatever your definition of wealth is. Can everybody say cha-ching? Cha-ching. All right. So the five-year plan benefits, it puts cash in your pocket every single month, creates wealth at the same time. There are six benefits to the plan. Number one, or going countdown backwards, number six, 30-year mortgage is now cut in half. Annual rental income is 48,456 not including the rental increases, right? Number four, you own five properties free and clear. Yeah. Number three, projected value is a million dollars at the five year mark. And now we have options. Options like, where do I go on vacation? Do I go to the island of Catalina or Bora Bora? Medical, do I go HMO or PPO? You know what I mean? Options in life. And the number one benefit is this. Financial freedom. That's what we're all after, right? It's financial. I don't know where it went, but it's there somewhere. Financial freedom. But you got to get it started. You cannot sit on your hands and wait. You cannot attend club meeting after club meeting and do nothing whatsoever. You need to network. You need to uh, reach out. You need to get outside of your comfort zone. In fact, you got to get comfortable getting out of your, your comfort zone. Because if you want that, that's what it's going to take. Now, you need five rentals in this scenario, but we're really after at least 20. And then I'm going to wrap it up. So the goal is to invest in at least one house per year. You figure you buy a $60,000 property, 20% down, that's $12,000 so out of your pocket. A lot of people can find that. Attack the mortgage principal if you get loans. But they must be affordable affordable to you as an investor, affordable to your next buyer, affordable to your tenant. Affordability factor, I've been talking a lot about tonight, is key. They've got a cash flow so that you can cover your expenses and they must be desirable. Desirable area, desirable rental market, desirable in regards to employment, desirable factor, uh, the desirability factor is huge. Then I always focus on properties that are poised for appreciation. I'm not after just cash flow. I'm not just after tax benefits because I am a greedy investor. I want it all. The trifecta of real estate. Another example here, 1,500 square feet, not including the basement, $48,000, pulls out 11.9%. Good neighborhood. Don't ever buy low income, guys. Don't buy low income. Working class are better because you want to receive your rents. Okay? Okay, so... <clears throat> If you're interested in learning more, I've got a free ebook. You can simply go to blackbeltinvestors.com to the invest tab and you'll find the ebook and you can learn more about that. And then also um, this Monday, webinar, free. I want to train you guys. If you like what I'm talking about here and building cash and wealth, then I'll teach you how to build wealth or cash through flipping properties. 11 a.m., 7 p.m., your choice, okay, this Monday. And now, since you've attended today, I'd be more than happy to guys give you guys my fix and flip calculator. Anybody interested in that? I'd be more than happy to give you a fix and flip calculator. It's really cool because what you'll do is you'll take this calculator and it's a little bit more sophisticated than this, but you'll start plugging in the numbers where it tells you to plug in. It shows you where your expenses are going, shows you how you're going to get your return, whether it's a good deal or not. And uh, we use it all the time in my office. If you're interested in that, then you'll just fill out this form right here. Okay, and we'll email it to you. Now I know some of you have great writing, but some of you look like you write with your feet. So do me a favor, print clearly so we can email this out to you. You'll get it uh, probably by mid next week because we've got a holiday coming up on Monday, okay? Conclusion is this, number one, keep attending this meeting. They have quality speakers here, quality educators, number one. Not only that, you might want to consider 
being a client of Christina's if you're not already and get the consultation needed so that you can start taking steps. Am I not supposed to plug you? No, but it's okay. It's all right. I don't care. I'm doing it, I'm doing it anyways because I've seen what you've done. Simple as that. Okay? Not because I'm up here, but I've seen what she's done. So it's important. Okay? You must look. The Bible has an old verse. Of course it has an old verse. It's the Bible. It says, seek counsel. Simple. Seek counsel. You can't do it all on your own. So get the consultation. Get a plan, whether it's something simple like this 2010 plan or the five-year retirement plan. You can talk to your, your consultant about putting a plan together to get you off in the right direction. Because not every plan fits everybody. Then you must get it going. No more thinking about it. No more watching flip or flop on TV. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how they can take a, you know, go find a house, close escrow, fix it all up, flip it out, sell it, make a lot of profits all in 60 minutes. Pretty darn cool, huh? All right, and get at least one house per year so that you are now financially secure. All right, guys, if you like what I have, you're more welcome to come see me afterwards. Christina, it's all yours.